Private Lender Podcast, Episode 46. The Private Lender Podcast quote of the day comes to us from Christopher Rice, who said, Every day is a bank account, and time is our currency. No one is rich, no one is poor. We've got 24 hours each. This is the Private Lender Podcast, the show that shares practical advice and know-how for new and seasoned lenders, from private mortgages on single-family houses to joint ventures on commercial projects and beyond. Discover details about investment vehicles that you won't find at your local bank or online broker. Listen and learn from private lenders and real estate investors, as well as from professionals and entrepreneurs, as they share the details, strategies, and the insight that allows for successful and prosperous lending. Now, get ready to increase your ROI. Here's your host, Keith Baker. Reluctantly crouched at the starting line, engines pumping and thumping in time. What's up, people, and welcome to the Private Lender Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to providing practical, old-world principles to apply to growing wealth by investing in paper, debt, notes, private mortgages, and other asset-based investments. I'm your host, Keith Baker, and I'm on a mission to foster and promote an alternative economy where people just like you and me invest confidently and build wealth without banks or Wall Street. Today I'll be talking about flood insurance, why you need it, I'll go through the mechanics of a claim, a flood claim, and then why I think you should consider demanding it on top of title insurance and property insurance. And while I'm at it, I'd like to go ahead and invite you over to privatelenderacademy.com where you can sign up to get on the waiting list to learn more about the Private Lender Academy that will be launching in January, where it will be teaching people Soup to nuts, A to B, how to do a, we're going to start with private mortgages and how to vet the deal, analyze the deal, look at it, all that fun stuff. So if you want to learn more about it and get in early for some possible goodies, discounts, freebies, interesting opportunities, go over there and get on the mailing list at privatelenderacademy.com. So before we get into the discussion on flood insurance and a flood claim, let's go ahead and thank our sponsors. This episode of the Private Lender Podcast is proudly sponsored by CountyTaxSaleApp.org. With CountyTaxSaleApp.org, you get a very powerful lead generation tool in the palm of your hand, on your laptop, desktop, or any device you choose. Get real-time alerts for between 300 and 600 properties every month that are coming up for the foreclosure auction in Harris County, Texas, the third largest county in the United States. With this intuitive design and interface, the County Tax Sale app lets you search all properties with highly motivated sellers that are coming up for foreclosure auction. Simply search the map and click on a property to learn important details about that property, such as the address, owner's contact info, minimum bid, and a street view photo. You can save properties to your favorites and contact the sellers directly and receive email and text alerts if one of your favorite properties is redeemed or canceled prior to the auction. You can even listen to Sammy Gupta on episode 28 of this podcast as he discusses all the powerful features and benefits of CountyTaxSaleApp.org. For more information, go to the Private Lender Podcast sponsor page, the show notes page for this episode, or to CountyTaxSaleApp.org. That's CountyTaxSaleApp.org. I'd like to give a big thank you and a shout out to CountyTaxSaleApp.org and Sammy Gupta for their continued sponsorship of the Private Lender Podcast, and I'd like to encourage you to check out the CountyTaxSalesApp.org. I mean, I don't know where else you're going to find uh, motivated seller leads for less than three cents a day in the third largest county or metroplex in the United States in terms of uh, foreclosures and whatnot. And of course, I'd like to thank Landon and Ray over at 713 RIA. Come on out on the second Wednesday of every month. Say hi to yours truly. I'll be out there at the Holiday Inn Express at 125 West Airtex and I-45 North in Houston, near the Intercontinental Airport. Okay, so now that we've paid the bills, let's get to the topic at hand, flood insurance. And this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart for a few reasons. Number one, my wife and I went through our own flood insurance claim on our primary residence back in April of 2009. A freak, freak, no storm, no named windstorm, no Harvey, no no Rita, none of that, uh, no Ike, just a, a freak springtime rainstorm, thunderstorm that just sat over West Houston and dumped a tremendous amount of water. That's one reason. The next reason is flood policy through the National Flood Insurance Program. Now, you'll buy it through State Farm, Farmers, or uh, Allstate or whoever, but it's relatively cheap. They just sell the policy and they will administer any claims. It's all backed by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. That's why it's so cheap. It's, sub it's government subsidized. 
And I mean, this is one case where as an investor, you ought to take advantage of this subsidy and the relatively low price it would cost your borrower to have the uh, flood insurance. And I'm also in my, in my daytime, in my real life, not just on TV, I'm a licensed insurance adjuster. I hold a property and casualty that is. I hold licenses in four states and reciprocity through a whole bunch of others. And in the last five years, I've adjusted several commercial and industrial flood claims whose settlements total in excess of $160 million. So I've seen some flood claims and what it can do, and I've handled a lot of other people's money during that process. And the bottom line, the moral of the story is, after Harvey, I now demand flood insurance on all of my notes. And people say, oh, it's not in a floodplain. Well, you know, back in 2009, when my house flooded, we had some, some very, we were fortunate enough to have good neighbors across the street from us who only took on just a, a little bit of water in one corner of their room. We had a uh, young baby at the time. The neighbors said, come on over. And so we waited across the, the water, the street, and we were talking with the neighbors and they asked if we had flood insurance. I said, yes, I've always had it. My dad it just kind of beat that in my brain. If you're going to live in the Houston area, you better have flood insurance. There's just no getting around it. So I asked them if they had flood insurance and they said, no, we don't because we don't live in a floodplain. And I pointed to my house across the street and I said, neither do we. So if you do live in a low lying area and it's all flood insurance, is, sorry, mm, look at that. I'm getting all choked up about this. <laughs> if you live, live in a low lying area or near the coast or river or so on, you are going to, you should just go ahead and expect that those flood policies are going to cost more because the likelihood of a hundred year event or a 50 year event damaging a property is, is pretty high. So it's weighted if, you know, if you're not in a flood zone, it is relatively cheap and you can go to the FEMA National Flood Insurance Program to find out more or just call your agent actually and then talk to them about it. But when we flooded, we bought the house in, I'll treat this just like any other real estate investment. So we bought the house in early 2006. It was 1,500 square feet, nice little ranch style home in the Spring Branch area of Houston. Uh, had an 8,500 square foot lot, 1,500 square feet of living space, paid $120,000 for it. And then we lived in it for three years before we flooded, a little over three years. And during those three years, it cost $300 every year for a flood insurance policy. And I, we had it at closing. I demanded it at closing and just kept renewing it every year. So by the time we flooded, I had paid $900 into flood premium, flood insurance premiums. And at the end of 2009, after the house was all rehabbed, rebuilt, not rebuilt, but you know, rehabbed and remodeled with the contents, the building and the contents, my total flood insurance claim was $95,000 is what I got out of my claim. Now, the far majority, that didn't really cover everything, but it did allow me to spruce up the house. I became the general contractor myself because I, I do have a construction background. So I did all the subs out, got all the sub the subcontractors, out, the electrician, the HVAC, sheetrock painting, flooring, put in some nice hardwoods, some four inch oak and with a nice dark stain, let the wife choose the pallets and all the rooms, all that fun stuff that goes along with remodeling a house. And we held on to it for a few more years and we're able to sell it for 315000 So I consider that my best investment I've ever made. And even though I had started going through, but when we flooded, I had already remodeled the three bedrooms and the hallway myself. So all that had to be redone. But at least with the flood insurance program, the national flood insurance program, I think I had it through all state at the time. It, it took care of it. I also had to go live with my in-laws and that's another podcast story for, no, not this podcast, but somebody else's, but we'll get to that at another time. But let's look at how it happened. Okay. So it uh, starts raining on a Monday night. And about 4 a.m. on Tuesday morning, I see little geysers coming up between the floorboards with the hardwoods. And I was like, oh, boy, here we go. We're flood. So it was on. Notified. After the floodwaters went down, I notified my agent and I got an appointment with an adjuster. He came out. Typical fashion. Really wasn't too keen on repairing much more than about a foot. Uh, damage. He, he was under the impression that, that I didn't get very much water in the house. We had a few inches. And... Once he found out that I was uh, in the business, so to speak, it um, became a little easier to negotiate with him. I was able to, sp to speak his language to get a little more out of it, which I thought was justified. I mean, it's not like I was adding on to the house or anything. We had, you know, put in some nice material in the bedrooms in the hallway 
and he had originally scoped it down as just kind of the cheap builder's grade stuff. So yeah, a little back and forth. We got it for, like I said, 95,000 totals, about 65,000 in the dwelling. So they send me a check for $5,000 to get going right off the bat. So that gets the dumpster in the driveway. I get my friends, the beers, the pizzas. I go cheap because I'm the general contractor and real estate investor. So we're notoriously cheap people. And we rip it out. We just rip it out. And thank you to, let's see, it was Aaron, Christian, Cabot, James, and Matt. Yeah. So, uh, oh, and Andrew as well. So anyway, those guys really helped me out on the demo. They had a lot of fun. It's always fun to go to someone else's house and beat the crap out of it and just, you know, rip stuff down without any consequence. So anyway, fast forward a few months, I totally remodel. I get all new HVAC, all new duct work, and new lighting, recess cans, granite in the kitchen, granite in all the bathrooms. And went with porcelain tile. I did all the, removed the tile myself and took the, the the savings and put it into porcelain rather than ceramic tile. And that's a little thing I recommend in areas like, like Houston or the Gulf Coast where you have a very clay-based soil. We call it gumbo soil. So when it dries, it, it shrinks and it cracks. And you know, that's why you'll see cracks in the ground. And then when it's wet, it swells up because it's, there's a lot of clay. So the porcelain won't prevent your tile floors from cracking as your foundation shifts, but they're a little more durable. So just an idea, a uh, little tip to the wise out there. Ding. Okay. So anyway, they gave me a $5,000 check right there. Well, pretty, he, he mailed it. They mailed it. They, they put in for it and I got it a few days later. That got me going. And then I went to my parents. I said, look, I need to, let me borrow some more because what I didn't realize was I thought I'd just get the money. I'd get the fix and do the money or make the repairs and then get paid back. But the Wells Fargo at that time had purchased my mortgage. So that first check for five grand went straight to me. That was to get going. Then my first draw was written to me and Wells Fargo. They were the mortgage holder on my policies. They required, they didn't require flood insurance. They're glad I have it. But whoever holds that first lien or holds that mortgage, a mortgagor, the mortgagor is the borrower, typically the homeowner in a mortgage. So the, the mortgagee is the bank, Wells Fargo. I get the check. I'd have to send it to them. They would endorse it. They send it back to me. I would endorse it and then be able to put it into my account to pay for the repairs. And before I could get the final, each step of the way, there was an inspection. They sent out an inspection. An inspector it didn't cost me anything, or at least nothing outside of what I paid my monthly interest and, and whatnot. But the inspector came out, saw that the work was had indeed been done. It was you know good to go. And when I finally had the inspector come out, he we were about 93, 95% complete. We just all we had to do is just pay, basically paint and we were done. So they released all the funds to me, but that's the beauty of insurance, whether it be flood, property, it doesn't matter. As a lender, I demand property and flood insurance on every property. So like a homeowner's policy, basically, or a landlord's policy, a dwelling policy at a, at a minimum, and get into that some other day about how you can, you know, each state has, a, has its own promulgated forms, and but just wherever you're listening to this from, in whatever country, just know, you know, it's good to have the property insurance. And if you can get flood, absolutely. If you're near anywhere near water, even if you're not, I think it's. I just think it's smart to do so. But as a lender, now if if I'm loaning to a real estate investor, and let's say he's he's going to flip a house, or he or she, so he buys the house. I loan the money. I don't loan all of it, right? I just loan what he needs, and then as he does his work, I do the draw. My, that gets inspected, just like the bank, right? So that way, I'm not loaning all the money out at once. I, I don't want to have paid more for a house than, than it's worth at any point in time. So you give the purchase price and you do the draws. And the bank does the same thing when a claim comes along. They want to make sure that that asset, that property that's that's backing their investment is indeed going to be fixed up and they have that control. So do you as a lender because you're the mortgagee, you're the mortgage holder or the lien holder. And it's part of your paperwork that it's a requirement to have property insurance, title insurance, and flood insurance. And if they don't carry property or flood, that's grounds for foreclosing. You can default on the note. And I don't know of any other investment where you, you can, as the, you know, as the lender, you can put policies against that asset that's backing your investment. Whereas, you know, Wall Street, there's no direct insurance policy. Now there are options. There are, you know, there are other ways to hedge your bets, but you can't go to a Wall Street broker and say, I want to buy an insurance policy that the, my IBM stock doesn't go down. doesn't happen that way. And this is yet another reason why I love private lending and investing in notes because of, because there are insurance policies 
specifically to protect that asset. Now, I didn't always require flood insurance, but after Harvey, I sure did. And that that was because over the last three to five years in Houston, we've had some pretty just horrendous flooding, floods. Stuff that the Labor Day flood, the Tax Day flood, Harvey. And each time it seems like parts of town that had historically never flooded were getting flooded. So that just led me to believe that, and this goes not just for Houston, but anywhere, but particularly in Houston because of the, the population density, but just along the coasts in general. It's not a question of if, it's just when. Now, is that 100 years from now, 5 years from now, 1,000 years from now? Who knows? But Mother Nature really doesn't care. And one of the beauty things about the National Flood Insurance Program is it's so cheap. So even now, if I looked up, the national average is about $700. Now that $700, those the national average, coastal areas, low-lying areas, that's all that's included. So if you're not in a floodplain, you're not going to pay that much. I was paying $300 a year in 06, 07, or uh, yeah, it was 06, 07 through 09. Then in, uh, in 10, it went up to 360, I think it was. It went up very little, even though I had had a claim. I expected it to go up, but I had a claim. Since I had a claim, I should say. But if a borrower, investor is going to balk at three to $500 for an annual flood insurance policy, which they if, if they're flipping the house for six months, they can get about half that money back. They can get half of their premium back. They have to show that the house has been sold, et cetera, et cetera. There is a process. But if they're going to balk at that, it might not be that good of a deal, especially if you're already, already in a low-lying area behind a levee, behind a dam, near a canal, lake, river, whatever. To me, it's a no-brainer to add on to it. And you know, maybe you, know, you could say, hey, Keith, you know, you're a Houstonian. You're living in Houston. And you're you know, in a crap area for floods. Yeah, you got me. And this has definitely you know, colored my vision on flood insurance and especially as a lender. But at the end of the day, it's my money. It's my investment. It's my retirement, my rules. And I'm happy to walk away from anyone who's not going to get flood insurance. And people have balked at it. And that's fine. That's their prerogative. It's my prerogative to decide I want to have it on all my loans or all the properties that I loan against. And it's their prerogative to say, you know what? I don't want to use that guy because it costs me too much money. That's fair. I don't have any problems with that. But if you're lending money, I highly, highly, highly recommend you demand it. Demand flood insurance from your borrowers. All right, so this has been a bit of a bit more of a rant than I had wanted to uh, to go on. But there's one other thing I wanted to say is a lot of people think that homeowners insurance covers flood, and it doesn't. That's why there's a separate program that's backed by the federal government to subsidize the premiums because your homeowners policy isn't going to cover water from. It might cover your pipes. You have to look at it and you have to see to determine. But one thing I can unequivocally categorically say it won't cover is flood that comes from rising waters of any stream, pond, lake, ocean, sea, any body of water that comes up. If your street floods backs up and comes in, homeowners will not cover the damages for that. It won't it will not be a covered claim under a homeowner's policy. So demand flood insurance, I'm sure I'm going to anger a lot of investors by saying it, but I've already told you my reasons. My money, my rules. So I think I'm going to wrap it up now and I'd like Thank you for listening, sharing your most valuable asset with me today, you know, your time. And I'd like to remind you to go over to privatelenderacademy.com to get on the waiting list to find out uh, all that fun stuff. I hope I can launch it in January of 2019. We will see. But since I'm, I'm putting it out here, talking about it uh, now, maybe I can get off my duff and, and actually put that thing together. So please go to privatelenderacademy.com, get on the waiting list. Also, please rate and review. Uh, that's the only price I ask for. Listening to the podcast is go to iTunes, particularly because that's still the 800-pound gorilla in the room for the time being, and leave me a rating and review. Uh, you can, in your review, go ahead and promote your business. Promote your, If you're a wholesaler, you're a landlord, whatever, you have anything to promote, you're a dentist. Hey, put it out there in the review, and periodically I check them, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to start reading those on the air. I know I've been threatening to do that, but you guys aren't leaving any business reviews. Well, one, but it was, and then, never mind, it was a joke. <laughs> so please go do that. Also, connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn and bigger pockets. I'm trying to increase my presence on the social front. It's a little difficult, but please reach out for me there. And I'd like to uh, thank you again, and I wish you happy and prosperous lending and investing. I'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Private Lender Podcast with your host, Keith Baker. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit privatelenderpodcast.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time. And 
second, I need to do a little bit of a PS here. If you're following along closely and you were checking my math, you were probably grinning at the obvious mistake I made. I had paid four premiums at $300. Actually, it's about $1,220. I want to say the year we flooded, I think we went up uh, 10 or 20 bucks. And so that was pretty obvious. And of course, I catch that little mistake as soon as I click to stop recording. The other thing I forgot to mention, two people who helped me demo the house, Michael and Nian. Thank you very much. Coworkers of mine who came by and lent a helping hand and tore up my house, my flood house. So thank you guys. Thank you to everyone. And now I'm going to let you get back to your day. Take care.